tomorrow. Opie and Anthony's Wow Road Trip on WNEW. Pinnacle Horny Goat Weed is the official sponsor of tomorrow's Wow Caravan. See you on the road. <laughs> Opie and Anthony Show. Let me let you ladies in on something. Oral never gets old. Home of the Hummer. 1027 WNEW. 1027 WNEW, the band Tantric and Breakdown. It's the ONA Show, 212-757-1027. Look who is in our studio, Anthony. Mick Foley. I got to say, you know, we interview a lot of uh, the WWF wrestlers and stuff. Yeah. This is a thrill for me. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd heard you guys were uh, were kind of uh, Foley fans, and I yeah. hate to disappoint you, but uh, uh, seeing as how well the Chris Jericho as Fozzie refusing to break character <laughs> interview went, that was, that was uh, great. I I, I just want to be known as the dude while I'm here. The I'm, dude? I'm, yeah, I do love talking to you guys. The dude, love. Yeah, it's not Did you hear? Anymore. You heard about I, that interview? I, I was in the worst traffic jam in, in New York, you yeah. know, and uh, on the way uh, to Long Island, and I heard almost the whole thing. And you guys are <laughs> telling me, hey, look, we love Chris Jericho. We want him here. We don't want this Moose McQueen. Neil Drew. Neil Drew, yeah. Neil Drew, yeah. Drew, so, and, and I'm like, Chris, for crying out loud, just break character. <laughs> he wasn't You're budging. Killing us. He yeah. was not budging. Oh, we were we, we were so frustrated though with that man. I got. But well, we had a good time with him. I mean, because we goofed on the whole thing, and then yeah. Triple H, we had a great time with. Uh, we had Triple H spanking and girls last time. You're kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. Any girl yeah. I can spank here? Oh, oh come on! Where's the, where's a girl he can spank? I'm not Kevin. He's got a sizable <laughs> big cat. No, 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 not made for spanking. Sorry. No, no. You, Why? Who do you got? It's her last day. No, you can't. You can't have. Nick Foley, you don't want to be. Wait, wait, you don't want to be. You'll kill her. Foley, dude. You know, I write children's books. Yeah, I'm exactly. Really kidding, you know. I, <laughs> I mean, Anthony, I just a, got nervous. Now I, I can talk the talk, but I can't walk the walk. Yeah, no, no, she's uh, she's in Triple H yeah. drew blood. You look too nice. He drew blood. He was spanking yeah. this girl, and uh, there were like blood vessels broken on her ass cheek. We, we're a little disturbed at that oh, one, man. And we yeah. enjoyed it, though. Yeah. She seemed to uh, want Jeez, it. Man. Anthony, a Long Island boy. I know. Warren Melville. Yeah. Yes. We, we, yes. Were, we were going at it outside uh, the studio because uh, Harbor Fields, Ward Melville, big, big rivalry. Basketball rivalry. Yeah. Rivalry. Yeah. And, and that was 81, I believe, right? Right. right. Yeah. And, and they beat us. You know, they they did. Fields that year, and we had Brett Barrett, all American Brett Barrett, up on the team. I was too busy uh, smoking pot in my <laughs> high school, uh, John H. Glenn High School, which I think were the champion pot smokers back then. You guys could argue your basketball, but uh, well, he was his father was the athletic director yeah. for Ward Melville. But yeah. you didn't really you played a little what lacrosse. You know what I? Uh, my, there was like a rule. I had to play three sports, and as a sophomore, like my dad thought, like making me play sports was was perfectly understandable. Yeah. and and and. I love sports, but I mean, I, I went, I played football, and it was like, uh, you know, I, I said in the first book that, that my problem was I wasn't a good team player, and like, <laughs> I don't want to get hit. I mean, it's one thing to get in front of twenty thousand people and understand, okay, this is gonna hurt for a, this is gonna hurt for a while. Yeah. But to get hurt on practice, you know, so when they go to pick teams, I'd conveniently bend down to tie my shoelace, mm -hmm. uh, and then when it came to you know basketball, I just want to sit back and put up twenty footers, and, and, <laughs> and that's uh, you know, and I, and I played lacrosse, but I was a goal which is cool because you got the pressure on you and it really wasn't until I wrestled my senior year I was like yeah this is it you know I mean it doesn't feel so good to be pinned in front of all your uh, you know your buddies and the whole school and lose the meat for the team but at least it's you out there doing it there's probably somebody still out there just going yeah I kicked Mick Foley's ass. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people out there. And your dad must have been rolling his eyes going, Mick, get off the roof. You're not going to have a career doing that. Uh, that was a little bit later on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On. yeah. I'm when the guy started that started this whole mess, apparently. Well, yeah, really. Well, I, I want to read this uh, on the air. Mick Foley doesn't know I'm going to read this. This is from, um, which book was this from? Well, if you read it. No, I, no, I was asking someone. Okay, you'll, you'll know. Because okay. I've read both books. Okay, thank you. And I, I like both books a lot. You're talking about Foley is Good, my new book, which is available. Very good. Look everywhere. at that. Okay. Very good. <laughs> and you're doing some uh, signings, right? Yeah. I'm going to get that out of the way. Yeah, let's let's uh, yeah. plug that. Let's get it out of the way. I'm going to be at the uh, WWF New York tonight. from five. It says from 5 to 7. I'll be honest with you. I'm not even going to pretend that this signing and all these signings aren't important to me. And so it pretty much if you show up, even if there's a big line, and I am hoping there is a big line, because if I'm not, you'll see a... 
grown man cry like a baby right after <laughs> WWF New York. It's a big line. Don't worry, because I'm going to sign until everybody's book is done. And that's uh, today from 5 to 7. Then we go to Stony Brook. Uh, only about 10 minutes from where I grew up. Tomorrow at Borders from 7 to 9 or till whenever. And then Saturday, I believe, let me check my cheat sheets, from 5 to 7 on Saturday <laughs> on his hand. at the media play in Poughkeepsie. He was saying outside the studio that he has to write things down when he goes into the ring. So he can remember. Oh, really? Well, you know what? Like, I don't, uh, they don't usually write things for me. And, and, you know, the first, like, 14 years of my career, we never had any, like, scripted interviews. And it was that last year, I'll admit, when they started going with, like, the 25-minute dialogues. You have to know what the other guy is saying or else it's just a big mess. But this time, you know, they, they, I was going out there for the first time in a while. I'd been off TV for a little bit and I had a bunch of stuff to say. And about five minutes into it, I just drew a complete oh, line. No. I mean, like a big time one. And the crowd was chanting Foley. Foley like it was a strategic pause but after about 45 seconds went by and no one was chanting my name I mean I was I was really oh, no. I was one second away from stop, just saying look Vince you know Vince is supposed to come to the ring I'll be honest with you I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> so maybe you guys ought to just come down here and we'll try to you know uh, suspend their disbelief in a couple minutes and the thing was what I was supposed to do is plug my book so it's like I forgot the most important thing of all but I, I do keep a couple key words there and I look down I'm looking at Rikishi, you know, I'm looking at like single words. I'm like, none of this is ringing a bell. It was, it was downright ugly. I was probably back uh, backstage uh, just going, oh my God, he's lost his mind. <laughs> right. He doesn't know what he's going to talk about. See, I thought all that stuff was uh, scripted all the way, but you guys kind of just go with the flow and you know, make it I, up I, as you I, go, I, right? You and the ad lib. Like I said, when you, anytime there's five or six guys in the ring at the same time, chances are they've gone over it. But but even then, we were shocked. Uh, uh, Edge was in a movie called Highlander Part 7, I think, was it? Ed? Yeah, the last one. Highlander, well, it was Highlander 4. And they had, what's the guy's name, the little guy, uh, the, the star of that? Uh, no, I didn't see that one, man. Christopher Lambert. It used to be Lambert, and then he always seemed to be very kind. <laughs> and, uh, and he was there, and they handed him like like two sentences to say, you know, and, and he wasn't trying to be snotty or anything or be a big star, but he looked at it and he goes, maybe if I had a week. <laughs> and meanwhile, we get these like pages of dialogue, and my mother asked me one time, she's like, how many days in advance do you get that? I said, days? I said, I got that 15 minutes before I went out. You know, wow. you get the guys try to remember what to say, and the amazing guy's Kurt Angle has like a photographic memory. Like he looks at things uh, once that. repeats it verbatim, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, damn, I can't remember commercial reads without the copy. I sit there and feel tongue-tied. So here's a quote from uh, one of the McFoley books. I'm not sure which one offhand. I find the whole talk show experience to be a little odd. Oh, yeah. This is really good. Meeting people you barely know or have never met, acting like good friends while the cameras roll, and then sitting awkwardly during commercial breaks. <laughs> <laughs> then the commercial ends, and bam, you're best friends again. Hey, it's true. This happens in this studio. Hey, and I'll, and I'll go out here and I'll say, yeah. you guys both came out and we were talking during the, the commercial break, so I can't say that about you guys. But, I mean, there was, you know, like, well, geez, I mean, I, I kind of rag on Roseanne a little bit in the book. But it was like, you know, that, here's this woman making millions of dollars, and her producer comes up to me and says, now, look, um, we've got some questions we wrote for Roseanne, but she's not really good at asking questions. So if you could maybe try to get her involved in a conversation, you know, she's good at that. I said, all right, you know, okay. I'll try. And then she said, look, we, we put together some really good clips, but Roseanne isn't really good at remembering to call the clips. Oh, my so, God. You know, if you want your clips to be seen, you better call them up yourself. And I'm thinking, what the hell qualifications are necessary to be a talk show? Host? <laughs> You're hosting the show. It's unbelievable. I stumbled out of there, and they were, like, bowing down reverently to me just because I'd, I'd made it through the show. It was horrible. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, we got to take a break really fast, but uh, before we do, uh, uh, Foley is Good is the new book. You got to tell Anthony your theory about poo. I was trying to explain that to him in the back office. Do we have this time? Do we have a couple minutes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, if anyone is anyone's a real big wrestling fan, in other words, a guy without a girlfriend, <laughs> if they're a real big Foley fan, and if you go back and you look in the archives, almost any mainstream media interview, like a 2020 or the biography, you'll notice one constant. That is. I'm wearing Winnie the Pooh clothes. Because, really? Yeah, and my theory is, it's never been scientifically proven, but to me it's just a common sense thing, is you're, you're facing a lot of times, the, the mainstream media looks down on the wrestlers, or, or, or they don't mm -hmm. like you, and they're willing, they want to be con confrontational, you know, because uh, cause we're a little bit controversial. My feeling is, if you want to be mean to somebody, and you look down, and there's that chubby little cup all stuffed with fluff. You can't quite do it, you know? And, and I'm like, I, I wear this stuff all the time. I like it anyway.
anyway, you know, I, I, a nice, gentle little guy, you know, makes up for the fact that I'm ugly and <laughs> kind of puts people at ease. But, but that's true. I, I have utilized poo, uh, my poo theory, and then I go later in the book, uh, or uh, right after that, and talk about how really the, you know, we're supposed to look at Winnie the Pooh like this is a, a tremendous family living in the woods, and really they're a bunch of dysfunctional idiots out there. <laughs> Right? The whole poo family? Well, you know, I, it makes sense, though, we, if you read the book. We take flack for being violent and then being, you know, inconsiderate. And I'm looking like the original Winnie the Pooh movie, if you remember... Who was stuck in Rabbit's Hole, his, his living quarters I'm talking about, <laughs> right? for like a week because no one would dig him out. It was like Rabbit wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't go, he wouldn't get him out. And they made Pooh basically starve himself until he could ease himself <laughs> out of there. You know, they didn't even put a little Vaseline around that hole or something. And I'm thinking, these people are cruel. <laughs> Rabbit's an anal retentive neat freak, right? Uh, yeah. Owl has a serious uh, superiority complex. Tigger is like the guy with the speech impediment. He's really just out for himself, totally narcissistic. <laughs> and uh, and then what I said about Eeyore, I said he's not even manic depressive. He's just depressive all the time. And I, I believe something never been touched on is that I believe Eeyore. I'm going to state it right here. Probably Eeyore is a homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? All right. Well, look. How does a guy put on his tail? With a nail. He gets nailed in the butt, doesn't he? <laughs> he gets nailed every day. Come on, every episode he's getting nailed in the butt. Yeah. And then Christopher Robin, you know. Well, you he's, know, he's, he's, yeah, he's got the socks yeah. a little too high. A little and stuff too like high. That, right? The loafers. And Pooh basically has been without pants for 30 years. <laughs> and I got a Christmas book yanked from thousands of stores. One of my elves was naked. And I'm like, look at this guy. The second, if you're completely naked like Little Bear, mm -hmm. you know, you're just being natural. But the second Pooh puts on a shirt, it means he's at least cognizant of the fact that he's supposed to be wearing clothes. And Some he chooses kind of not to. <laughs> Very good. God damn brilliant. I've never heard it quite put that way. All right, we got to take a quick break. If you want to talk to Mick Foley, 212-757-1027. The book is really, really good. I love the first one. I was telling him uh, outside the studio, I, I read it on vacation of all places. Let me nail your ass with my hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the second book, which is out now, Foley is good. He's doing a book signing at the WWF restaurant pretty much right after he finishes with us. And, Opie, cool. let these people know I actually write these books, you know. Nobody helping me out. I do I it by hand. And I can tell. You need an editor. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? I go on a little long? It's, uh, you know, on the train today, I was reading because uh, I'm, I'm up to the, uh, uh, the part in the new book where you handed in your book. Right. It's it. The book is like this thick. The first <laughs> it's one. like War and Peace. Yeah. It's, it's more, really. And, and you bitch and complain because uh, Tuesdays with Maury was only this big. Well, yeah, do you want? Should I share my you sex can't. toy uh, theory, or should we come back and I, I can under? I you can, can you can keep. Go ahead. I can read yeah. rambling. Yeah. My theory is all right. Now this goes back. Uh, my theory is like a book with Tuesdays with Maury. He heard this, and then he was real. Did you read the book? Uh, yeah, I read it, and it's good. But I, really... I, I, I got a lot of uh, flack for reading it. But is it really that good? I mean, if it was 500 pages, would you have read it? No. Would anybody have read it? Uh, no. All right, the reason that, and let's, uh, you know, I'll give credit where it's due. It's a good book, and it's un I mean, it's phenomenally successful. My last book was on the bestseller list for, for 26 weeks, you know. I'll be happy if this one squeaks on for one week. This book's been on for like 180 weeks. Oh. But the the reason I come up with is that he's he's obviously drawing a lot of people who don't usually read, hear that it's good, and then they see that they can knock it off like in an hour and a half. <laughs> so, all right, you know, I, you know, a big book I I say is like it's like a big book is like going out with a girl every day, having to spend quality time with her, buying her dinner, and not even having a guarantee you're going to nail her at the end of the relationship. It's like you know you don't know how the book's going to end. You're not going to you really like it. And so what I thought and automatically is when I was in Montana on a wrestling tour in like 1987 right after I graduated college we're out in the middle of nowhere and a bunch of us go to an adult shop and we're kind of like thinking you know we're going to be uh, smart guys and we say excuse me ma'am can you tell me what your most popular dildo is <laughs> and she you know we're looking at these things that are just a potpourri of some of the most <laughs> massive members you've ever seen in your life and she brings us over to this little tiny thing that it looks like something my mother used to take my temperature with and she says this is this is our most popular model. I was like, what the hell? You know, 
why don't they just use me instead, you know? <laughs> and, and I said, well, why? And she goes, well, most women using a sex toy have never used one before, and they find it to be less threatening. <laughs> so I, what I say, and now Mitch Album will probably rag on me again, uh, as I say, you know, well, Tuesdays with Maury was the less threatening dildo, and mine was like a baby's arm holding an apple. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you have to commit to read your autobiography, but it's right. really, really good. All right, uh, more with Mick Foley next, yeah. and uh, we're going to play some commercials and sit here awkwardly for a few minutes. So. <laughs> Stay there. We'll be back when we come back on the Opie and Anthony Show. And you're never going to amount to anything. It's awful. It's awful. Very, very offensive. It's part of the trade for the airwaves. I cannot believe that those morons are on the air. I don't know, Anthony. I think this is better than a rock block, don't you? Only half is nauseating. 107 WNEW. 1027 WNEW is The Sports Guys at 5 a.m. The Radio Chick at 9. Ron and Fez at noon. Opie and Anthony at 3. Don and Mike at 7. Next on a very special Ron and Fez. The guys make plans for Mother's Day. I'm getting mother flowers and chocolate. I bet she loves them both. I bet she eats them both. Rude and rude. Are you taking your mother out? No, my mom can't get out like she used to. Oh, illness? No, house arrest. Dealing drugs. All on the next Ron and Fez. Ron and Fez. Middays, noon to 3, 1027. WNEW. Anthony, uh, Sobe Beverages. Sobe, the leader in healthy refreshment, Opie. All Sobe Beverages, specially formulated to uplift the mind, body, and spirit with great tasting teas and fruit blends that's been uh, enchanted with herbs and other natural supplements. Yeah, this week's flavor, Sobe Dry from the Power Line. Great tasting natural grape strawberry punch with a passion producing herb. Package of uh, Epidemium, a.k.a. Horny Goatweed. Horny Goatweed's gotten itself into Sobe Beverages, people. For male potency, Siberian ginseng, uh, ginseng to increase stamina, and Muria Puma? What is that? To increase the sex drive. You, uh, you drink this Sobe Drive, your bed's a slip and slide. Sobe's unique packaging consists of a 20-ounce lizard embossed glass bottle and labels that feature the brand's signature Sobe Lizard. Under each cap, there's a different lizard slogan. For more info about Sobe and all the different products, go to SobeBev.com. Feel free to share any Sobe experiences by calling uh, the Sobe Lizard line, 1-800-588-0548. And be on the lookout for the Sobe Lizard Love Bus, spreading the uh, Sobe experience all over the country. So grab a Sobe and drain the lizard. Tomorrow, Opie and Anthony's Wow Road Trip on WNEW. Don't go to uh, CNN for dick jokes. Don't, don't come here for the news. We are the Opie and Anthony Show. I, I like it when this show is dirty. 1027 WNEW. And we're hanging with Mick Foley today, Anthony, from the WWF, of course. Yes. He's got a second book out called Foley is Good. That's true. And uh, he's doing a book signing right after he leaves us in about a half hour, 20 minutes or I'm so. I'm over there, but can I reiterate, uh, Opie, to these people that, you know, if you get off work at 5 and you're worried about there being a line, don't really worry because I intend to be there late into the night. Yes. I'm, I'm supposed to host SmackDown, but really, if there's people online, I'll run in and do my like, two minutes of hosting duties and run back out and uh, sign some copies. Can we uh, bring you some beer or something later? Uh, later on? You know what? This has been a long day, you know. I'm not mm -hmm. much of a drinker, which is good because I get buzzed on one beer yeah uh, but i could probably go for that one beer later and later this evening there right. you go there you have it can I, can I mention a few other things from uh the new book oh, yeah feel free that i enjoyed will it, it will it help me sell copies it, it should <laughs> you better the, the, rock it. <laughs> <laughs> the writing is is really really good very entertaining very funny a lot of comedy in the book uh here's something we talked about when i told everyone i was reading the new book baseball managers that wear uniforms. We went off on that. Yeah. What's the deal? I mean, doesn't anyone have the guts to stop and tell them how foolish they look? <laughs> Don Zimmer, from what I understand, is a wonderful human being, but he has got to be the stupidest looking guy in that outfit. I mean, I, I took some batting practice with the Twins a year and a half ago, and I looked... I'm not saying I didn't look bad in that outfit, you know. I mean, I looked really bad, but... Uh, uh, you know, Zimmer, and then they try wearing the, the warm-up jacket to cover it, and it's like, guys, please. <laughs> you know, I, like I think I said, you know, you're talking about middle-aged men wearing tight spandex <laughs> outfits, obviously meant for younger people. Right. Kind of like the WCW main event stars. <laughs> <laughs> that would always look so bad with uh, WCW, especially if you would switch back and forth uh, when they were on at the same time, obviously. I got to tell you, the reason 
when I switched from the spandex, I wore the the real great vibrant brown color there mm -hmm. for a while. There was a segment there was me, Rock, and uh, and Ken Shamrock in a three way cage match a few years ago, and it was a good cage match. And me and Rock were up on top of the cage. They got this area like with from lighting or gridding or something where you can actually sit on top of the cage. And we were throwing punches, which was cool. We were way up in the air. And then when I stood up, it was like the lights were shining in such a way on the back of my tights, and it was just dimple after oh, dimple no. after dimple. And I was like, oh, God, it doesn't even matter. I came off the top later. I mean, the only, I, mean I had a hell of a match. You know, the only thing people remember is that I, you know, yeah, I like an ass and just as twisties that backed into a belt sander. It was hideous. So I, right after that, I went with the sweatpants. Cool. We got a few people that want to say hi. Joe, what's up? Hey, what's up? Oh, Nate, you guys are the best. Oh, thanks. Uh, you me, man. Yeah. <laughs> Vic Foley, man, you're a you're a hardcore icon. That's all I gotta say. Your fuse are like taboo or legendary. Oh, you're the you. man. Thank you very much. Can I point out? I'm gonna I'm gonna admit the mistake. You guys passed me a note here saying. Uh, uh, saying that it's a fan had called and says, Mick, aware that he had used William Regal's real name, Stephen, this past uh, Monday night. <laughs> I'd say after my performance on Monday, that was the least of my problems. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Joe wants to ask. Are you going to be wrestling again, right, Joe? Yeah, I was going to ask when are you going to when are we going to see you in a ring wrestling? Again? Uh, you know what I'd like to do is maybe uh, get you know I have some kind of barometer here to feel uh, would people want to see me wrestle? I don't know. Well, oh, oh we love it. I, love I would it. think so. Yeah. Uh, you know what? If it was really done under the right circumstances, I, I would definitely think about it. Uh, and circa right circumstances, meaning they were going to pay me a lot of money to do it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, there is don't a part of yourself up enough. Uh, you know, it's like it's like what the percentage of people would look down on me for breaking my word and coming out of retirement would be somewhat minimal, especially when you consider that the average wrestling retirement lasts about six weeks. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I've gone about 60 weeks, which makes me, I'm like Abraham Lincoln of the wrestlers, you know. <laughs> what man of my word. What does your wife think, though, and the kids? Uh, you know, she was really, really for me retiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when that stock market started spiraling down out of control, I was like, Mate, mm -hmm. uh, you think you might want to do another match? <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Throw it in. We lost a little in the tech stock. See, I didn't, I didn't realize how much you guys got uh, hurt. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I wasn't stupid and thought, you know, and thought like a lot of people that wrestling is completely fake. I knew right. you guys were taking bumps and hits. But when you read his uh, his autobiography, mm. it's insane how, how hurt you guys get yeah, yeah, on a, a weekly lot, basis. Well, a lot of that stuff uh, was uh, happened. A lot of the major injuries happened before I was in the WWF. But back uh, when I joined in the end of 95, you we were still on the road quite a bit. And so, like, I, something like a sciatic nerve problem. Uh, you'd never had time to heal it, and it would just get worse and worse and worse. And now at least they have a schedule that's somewhat, uh, some semblance of sanity to it. You know, the guys are on four days a week, and they're off three. So if you really watch yourself and, you know, and take care of yourself, it, it's not that bad. It's still difficult. And, I mean, you know, then you'd throw in your personal appearances and the travel days. And when you add all that up together, you're still kind of working about 300 days a year, but at least you don't have as many matches as you used to have. Well, like That's the amazing. chair shots, though. I mean, that is. A yeah, you know, if I had it to do all over again, I think the one move I would have perfected, and, and since it's radio, you really can't see, but it would have been like that quick throwing my hand up to block the steel. Yeah, that everyone does that. Coming at high speeds to my head, and and now a lot of people do it. You don't hear anyone going, ah, he threw up his hand. I think most of the fans would deep down like to know. All right, you took my, it right to yeah. your forehead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was a little dumb. I mean, I had that going for me. Hey, Mick Foley doesn't put up his hands, and like, yeah. Mick Foley's an idiot, you know. <laughs> What the hell? I mean, all the guys now are putting up their hands, and no one thinks any less of them, you know? What do you think of Beyond the Mat with, you know, the, with I, your I, wife and kids in the front yeah, row? I mean, it's been well documented. Yeah, before. yeah. I mean, unfortunately, uh, they managed to catch my worst parental decision, you know, on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know... We're basically talking where, where he got beat up pretty good by The Rock and uh -huh. hit, hit, what, like 17? It was 11. It was 11, 17. 11 uh, chair shots to the head in front of his uh, wife and lot two, of blood. Yeah. wife and two small kids while he's uh, pretty much handcuffed to the road. Yeah, I was kind of helpless, and I didn't gauge, I didn't take into account how much more the shots would hurt, you know, when my hands were behind my back, because it really does take your body out of its natural alignment. And, I mean, that first shot just came in, and, and I said in the book, you know, I mean, that the, the tough guy part of me, that, like, one, you know, they like one percentage that is a tough guy refused to go down on one shot. And I went down on that first shot, you know, it put me right down to my knees. But the thing is, you know, the I mean, I've had a lot of good moments as a parent, but you don't you really see my father son talks on a right, right. movie, you know. You get the I made a mistake, the match got you know, the match uh, got a little out of hand, you know. I was a little too into my role. The Rock, I think, 
was getting off on bludgeoning me a little bit too much. And, and you know, it, I mean, it made for a great movie, but I didn't really know my kids were that upset because when I got to the back, they were like over it by then. Right. And then when I saw uh, th their reaction to the shots, like, ooh, somebody's a bad father, you know? Yeah. Jeez. Oh, man. That was awful. How is The Rock to deal with these days now that he's in uh, one of the biggest grossing movies? Oh, you know, I haven't seen him since then, you know? Uh, really? I would imagine he should be feeling pretty good about himself. Uh, you know, The Rock's a pretty down to earth guy. Yeah. I mean, everyone seems to get along pretty well with him. Uh, you know, he doesn't have his own dressing room or anything like that. Although, if I was in his shoes and my movie did 70 million the first uh, first week, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be changed with Al Snow. You know, that's just uh, <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I love the Al Snow abuse. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about uh, movies that wrestlers have made in the yeah. past, and um, yeah, the, the Rock had a great part in this. It was yeah. limited. It was, you know, not it was limited. Yeah, it was limited, but it was it was an important role. Yeah. I'd say, you know, in terms of importance as to what you know the movies did for a wrestler's persona, that his uh, Mummy Returns is just slightly ahead of my turn in. Big Money Hustlers. <laughs> Big Money Hustlers. <laughs> or How I Got My SAG Card. <laughs> hey, let's go to Steve. Steve, you got a question for uh, Mankind, Mick Foley, uh, whatever he's calling himself today. Yeah, hey, what's up, guys? How you doing? Hey, How you doing? What's going on, Mick? I'm doing okay. All right, I heard there was a story about something called the penis suplex in your new book. Yeah, listen, this is free radio, and that's a $26 story. <laughs> if you want to hear about the legend of the penis suplex and how Bob Holly left Al Snow hanging in the breeze for about 10 seconds upside down in front of 18,000 people in Montreal, unfortunately for Al, for those of you who have worn a jock strap and know what it does to the male organ, mm -hmm. there was really a very little hanging going on. There. Oh, it was like, no. And it was one of those things where I, it should have been like the triumphant thing. I mean, I talked Bob Holly into just really getting my revenge for me, humiliating Al in front of 18,000 people. But I mean, <laughs> but if I had, it was like, remember the, the uh, episode of Seinfeld where Costanza got caught right after he'd been in the cold pool? And, he, <laughs> and that was that was basically Al. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And and Al, to his credit, he got soup and when he finally landed, Bob had him upside down for about 10 seconds, and Al was trying to pull the damn thing over, but it just wasn't happening. And, you know, it was, Al was not displayed at his peak and uh, he hit the ground and I was sure he was going to be mad. I mean, I sure as I would have been mad. I was mad when Austin threw me in and exposed my love handles, you know, on Monday night. I was like, oh, and then you can't reach down and pull them down and then people are like, oh, I got to take that now, he's trying oh, to cover, he's trying to cover himself up. He's getting beaten up. He's more concerned with his roll of fat around his waist showing. So, <laughs> so uh, you do see that sometimes. That's funny. Hey, I'm, I'm one of the worst people, you know. That, I think that's part of the reason I started wearing the sweats. I mean, I was a big Puller upper, you know. I mean, I, you know, I'd be busted wide open. Foley, look at him. He's hurt. He's he's bull, he's, he's down. He looks like he's out. <laughs> oh wait a minute, he's pulling up his pants. <laughs> Al, Al hit the canvas and he had a big smile, a laugh on his face. And I just said in the book, I said, I said he was laughing. But if he'd seen things from my vantage point, I'm not sure he would have been. I mean, it was, it was like, oh, it was ugly. Maybe he's a grower, not a shower. There you go. Uh, let's go to James. James, what's going on? What's up, O&A? Hey. What's up, Mr. Mick Foley? How are you doing there? Not bad, you? You coming to the big book signing tonight? Hell yeah. All Couldn't right. miss it. Yeah, it's at uh, WWF restaurant. He's going to leave in a few minutes and start signing books at 5. So. Yeah, and, and like I said, if, if people show up at 5, 36, doesn't really matter because it is uh, understood that I will be there to the last person. Now, if you show up at, you know, 9, 30, maybe not. But, uh, you know, I'm pretty much going to be signing until the last person is done. Cool. Cool. You got a question, James? Yeah, man, Mick, I've been wondering this since it happened. What the hell was going through your mind when you fell 16 feet off of that cell through a table? Uh, that was Ooh, great. Let me see. It's yeah. like that Brian Regan bit. I, I know what was in his mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, honestly, uh, you know, when I when I convinced Vince McMahon, you know, to Vince's credit, Vince is not a sadist. He doesn't <laughs> ride the guys that hard. I was like, yeah, Vince, I think I'm going to come off the cage today. And he's like, no, no. It's like, look, Vince. You know I can drop elbows from high places, right? He goes, well, yeah. I said, I'm going to drop an elbow off there. You'd probably let me, right? He's like, well, I don't know. I was like, well, it's the same thing. <laughs> and, I mean, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, the guys are like, you, well, you've been up there, right? You're comfortable? I was like, yeah, I've been up there. I've been a long time up there. 
I hadn't been up that high in my life. I got up on top of there, and I was like, oh, uh -huh. God, you got to be kidding me. I mean, I looked down, and uh, when Undertaker threw me, honestly, what I was thinking was, I'm really high up, and that table looks really small. <laughs> uh, but the truth is, I mean, at least I thought the worst was over. Then, you know, they took me away in the, in the uh, stretcher. I made the triumphant return, climbed back up the cage. And then when I got choke slammed through the cage, which was not supposed to happen, that's actually when I got hurt the worst, because there's a chair up there on the, uh, on the cage. Uh, followed me down by about a foot and a half, and I hit and immediately went unconscious. So I was actually unconscious when the chair hit me in the face and, you know, put my tooth up my nose and did all that bad <laughs> yeah, that stuff. That was sick. Like, yeah. That was a, that oh, was, my God. That was a rough night, you know. That was a... Yeah. Great footage, though. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 you know, the nice thing about it is I did it once, and it got shown, like, it got shown over and over and yep. over again. And, you know, what the sad thing is there's kids out there trying to do the same stuff. And first off, they're not getting financially compensated. Second, they don't know what the hell they're doing. And the third is nobody really cares. You know, at right. least in my case, it was like a big deal was made out of it and, it. and it lives on. It was like a great moment in sports entertainment. But I, please, guys, you know, I, I you know, don't try to outdo it because if you do, no one's going to find out about it. If your goal in life is to be on the best of backyard wrestling video, then you've got more serious problems than I'm willing to take responsibility for. Nice. A little PSA from me. Yeah. Oh, there you go. A little disclaimer. <laughs> Tim, what's going on? Hey, guys. How you doing? Uh, doing well. Tim, uh, yeah. In fact, you just talked about it. I wanted to comment. Um, Opie, how you made a comment about mixed books when you talked about football and how, oh, you know, man. all of America... You know, condones football and people breaking legs and getting paralyzed. And then as soon as somebody wants to do, uh, you know, wrestling, backyard or whatever, it's like, oh, my God, what's wrong with these kids? That's uh, apparent. Know, okay, yeah. go ahead. It's a good point. And, uh, you know, one of the things in this last chapter, and I advise people, if they like me and want to keep their idea of me as a pretty good guy alive, don't read the last chapter of the epilogue because I kind of take on wrestling's critics. And, uh, I mean, I think it's a really interesting chapter. To me, that's the most important thing is try to, like, clear our name. Because, I mean, we have been, you know, we have been vilified so badly by these people. Mm -hmm. The thing is, nobody in the mainstream media is willing to go out there and say, okay, so what is in this study? Like, I found out Indiana University study where they say there's 128 instances of simulated sex. I mean, I finally got the professor on the phone because I kept calling his office, calling his office, calling his office. And uh, he was like, well, there was an instance with sexual chocolate. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I know about that one. But what about the other 127? I said, I'll be honest with you. I did my own study. And he goes, oh. And I said, has anyone else done their own study? He's like, I don't think so. I'm like, so wait a second. Here's this thing that's quoted in 37 different newspapers that I personally read, not to mention the news wires and, the, and radio. I mean, I don't know how many times I was probably uh, repeating across the country, news magazines. I'm like, no one checked out? No one story? questioned it. I said, so what is, uh, you know, sex? Would that be like uh, Mae Young smoking a cigar in bed and with the impression being that sex is just taking place? He's like, no. And I, and I asked him like three other questions. He said, no, no, no. I said, well, what is it? He goes, well, there'll be, for example, a woman rubbing a guy's arm. And I what? said, nah. uh, you know, like, don't you think that's misleading? He goes, oh, I don't think so. And I said, what about the simulated drug use? 42 instances of simulated drug use. And uh, and I said, you know, I thought, you know, X-Pac used to that thing where he says, you know, your ass is grass and I'm going to smoke it. I said, you know, if a guy puts his two fingers together, does that constitute simulated drug use? He says, oh, no. I said, what about if one guy says, you know, roll a fatty for this pimp daddy, like that mother up and say out loud, pimp it ain't easy. And, and I did the whole voice for him, too, on the phone. <laughs> pimp it ain't easy. We missed that, by the way. <laughs> he said, no. And I said, well, geez, I said, I really don't remember any drug use. And he goes, that would be drinking beer. And at that point, you're like, Whoa. you know, if the media is going to count beer drinking as, as simulated drug use, that was why I had to do my top uh, top double secret study on uh, five episodes of Cheers and find out their, <laughs> their incidence of uh, simulated drug use is actually 60 times higher than 60 times higher than ours. But when it comes to football, you know, I'm reading this guy, L. Brent Bozell, the Parents Television Council. He's got his report card for all of the, uh, for all of the uh, different networks, and he's really blasting ABC, saying, Saying that only Sabrina the Teenage Witch and the now canceled uh, uh, Boy Meets World, which I happen to have been on, it's a good show. <laughs> and he said, uh, as far as scripted entertainment, he goes, what else on the on the Disney uh, network that uh, isn't uh, uh, radioactive for children? And he mentions Monday Night Football. 
I thought, wait a second. I said, you're going to count a cookie sheet to the head as an act of violence? But these guys who freely admit that football is a violent game, it's like, I mean, you want to you wanna play fair, then, then there's six different violent acts taking place on every game. And I don't think mm-hmm. I'm being unfair to football. He's the first people willing to tell you proudly that football is a violent game is the players. Mm-hmm. You know, So I got a bunch of quotes from, from autobiographies where they're like, I couldn't think of a, you know, a nonviolent way to hit a guy. And another guy said, and I like to think my best hits border on felonious assault. You know, and it's like, well, wait a second. This guy is judging shows based on whether he likes them or not. And the thing is, the media doesn't question them. So I, I felt yeah. really strongly about that uh, that that last uh, that last chapter. And, and not to mention, you know, when a wrestler like me has got a, some broken bones and some injuries, people are like, oh, how pathetic. But if you're a football player, and it's there's cool. A, it's cool. It's like, way. look how noble that is. Yeah, he can yeah. barely walk. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I'm a better radio guest. I'll go on record and say I'm a better radio guest than Johnny Unitas ever was. <laughs> Without a doubt. I know we got to get you out of here. Okay. I just want to mention a couple other things. In the new book, Foley is Good. You made a um, a reference to George C. Scott and Hardcore, <laughs> and Anthony and I are convinced we're the only two that have ever seen that damn movie. We love it. Come on, well, I'm 35 now. I think I was 12 or 13 when we were trying to get in the back door at the old Port Jeff 77 cents. Yeah, 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 yeah. It went that. up like a penny every year. Yes. Like in 1970, it went up to 78 cents, and it was like a parade of people trying to ask someone who looked even remotely like an adult, hey, "Can you pretend yeah. I'm your kid?" You know. Because I mean, the title alone, hardcore, hardcore. You wanted to get in to see that movie. Oh, it was big stuff. But yeah, but I can't for life me remember why I used that hardcore reference. I think it was when you were. Um, uh, I think it was when I was talking about uh, Beyond the Mat, right? A Miss Roberts interview? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly, right. for 2020. Where they, 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 no, they raked me over the coals. Thank uh, you, yeah. They, they, what they did, pretty much, for those guys who don't know, is they had me respond as, like, this inspiration for these uh, backyard wrestlers. They had me, they wanted to get my response to uh, video clips of kids doing backyard wrestling. And they show this stuff, and it's like kids jumping on each other. It's like the stuff that I did, with, with the exception of the roof dive. If anyone mm-hmm. else looks at my backyard wrestling, it was punches that missed by half a foot. You know, it was really weak-looking leg drops and elbow drops where nobody was going to get hurt. And uh, And so they basically showed me that, and I said... I said, well, and I'm just a little surprised. Like, I feel like I've been around long enough to know when uh, there's a trap being set. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, you know, I've seen a lot worse stuff than that, and I have a feeling you're going to show me some worse stuff than that in a minute. And they all nodded their heads, and I said, but uh, what I saw looked like a bunch of kids having fun. So now they show me the next Ah, thing, and it's the cheese player to that. It's the barbed wire. It's all the wild stuff that kids really shouldn't be doing that I say they shouldn't be doing in my Ten Commandments (laughs) on Backyard Wrestling. But when the show airs two days later, they ask me the question. They show me the violent oh, footage. Oh, boy. Say, Mr. Foley, what do you think? And there I am going, hey, it looks like a bunch of kids having fun. I'm having fun. And I was like, you can't do that. you know. And that's when I realized that uh, basically respected news magazines like 2020 are, in a sense, every sense, faker than professional wrestling. Is that when you, so you're watching the clip I'm watching happen? The clip, and, yeah, and I said I felt like George C. Scott watching his daughter earn a buck the hard way in hardcore. <laughs> and like you guys say, there we go. Turn it off. Yeah. Turn it off. That must have been horrible. Turn it off. Get a good one. Turn it off. <laughs> one more. One more. One more. You know what? It works so much better with the film running. If it was a guy watching a video now, it wouldn't mean they have carried away. It's like, you know, there would. We talk about that movie all the time. When he he was in the the seedy hotel and and all the porn people were coming, he had to act like a porn director. Oh Oh, god, what a hilarious! He's auditioning the guys and they're unzipping their flies and pulling their junk out. And I'm big. uh, I'm big. Dick Black. Oh, where is that one? We got all the clips. Put it back. Yeah. It's now it's now a comedy though. I saw it recently. Put it back. I'm slapping through the whole thing. And here's uh, one of the people that were auditioning. I'm Big Dick Black. (laughs) I remember that. Big Dick Black came in. Yeah. I'm Big Dick Black. All right, two really quick things, and then we'll let you go. Um, You want to nail Barbara Eden? Yeah, that's a recurring thing. Well, (laughs) so do I, though. I, you know, I was uh, that my top ten list. You know, is actually kind of fun thing. You know, it's a, t- a chapter entitled Super Dad. I should point out, 
It's really two books in one. It's a sweet, sensitive story about a father doing his best to raise kids while holding down an, uh, a kind of wild job. And it's a wrestling book. So for your audience, skip the super dads and the boy who saved Christmas and all those people. <laughs> now, unless you're secretly a sensitive guy like myself. Uh, but in this chapter, Super Dad, I list my top ten amusement parks, top ten roller coasters, top ten movies, TV shows, and Christmas songs. And I was going to include a top ten list of people over 50 that I'd like to nail. <laughs> and Barbara Eden would have been right at the top of the list. Over 50. I, I wanted her growing up. I dream of oh, Jeannie. Man. I was convinced that was a live show. I'd watch to see if something was going to slip out. <laughs> well, don't you think? I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm a pretty pretty big star here. Right? I've written a bestseller. I've been on TV. you got a sure. documentary. Where Chef Boyardee, come, come on. Come on. <laughs> don't you think, I mean, there's a chance that Barbara Eden now in her mid-50s is watching that going, yeah, I, uh, oh, I, guy. I, I got that. we might even have a shot. You never know, point. and I've got that understanding with my wife that should the Barbara Eden uh, opportunity present itself, that uh, all bets are off. I got that with Drew Barrymore, with really? my girlfriend. Everybody's got to have at least one. You know, I've got like 17. You know. We start getting into 70s porn star Kay Parker. You know. <laughs> yeah, but the, the the image of it, the thought of it might be a little better than the reality. No, I doubt it. I doubt it. Really? I, I find older women very attractive. Really? Like yeah. even Barbara Eden. Definitely. I think once you had Barbara Eden's clothes off, you might be a little disappointed. No? Uh, no, no, because I'm one of those weirdos that uh, sees weirdos. the inner beauty in people. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Least, that's what I say to myself when I look at myself with harsh overhead lighting in a full length mirror. I'm just thinking I'm Barbara Eden. on the inside. <laughs> Barbara Eden's inner beauty wouldn't be as tight as other <laughs> people's inner beauty. You know what I mean? I, Don't you talk about Barbara that way? <laughs> and finally, he loves Britney Spears too, Anthony. Oh. Who doesn't? Oh, yeah. Oh. Come on. Tells a good story about Britney Spears in the book. It's a good story. It's a nice, yeah. sweet story. Uh. <laughs> She's doing it to me. Oh, yeah. And I had to actually, I, I get into this idea that I, you know, we met Brittany, and, uh, you know, Brittany didn't know hell who the hell we were, but that's not the story we told. We got back to the dressing room, you know. And I, I had this little fictional relationship with Brittany going on. Blue Meanie was a big Brittany fan. I mean, much bigger. I mean, I'll admit, I, I danced in the seat whenever uh, Hit Me One More Time came on, but I wasn't that big a fan. But the Meanie was like love struck. So I had uh, Miss Kitty, uh, who was the cat who was <laughs> fired. Yeah. yeah. Fired. Uh, she would leave messages on my cell phone saying she was Britney Spears and just little things. Believable. Believability is the key. You can't say, oh, I wanted you so bad. Uh -huh. It would be more like, hi, this is Britney. I just want to say I really like meeting you and I want to see you. Hopefully you'll be on tour when I am so I give you a big hug. <laughs> Stuff that sounds legit, you know. And it was all supposed to start taking a seedier, you know, a seedier turn. And about that time, my daughter, who was like five at the time, started really liking Britney. And there was that part of me that said, oh, I can't. Yeah, you know, I can't have a seedy relationship with Britney Spears, even if it isn't real. So, <laughs> Your fatherly <laughs> thing kicked out. I'd like to see if Britney likes it, because it is a nice story. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I regret saying that up close she looks suspiciously like any other 17-year-old. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's about the worst thing I say about her, you know? I mean, I'd like to think that she saw that She'd probably be really offended by that, you know? Probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we got to get you out of here so you can go to the, the book signing. The book signing. Listen, guys, if you're Long Island people and you can't make it out tonight, then we got the one at Long Island tomorrow in Stony Brook at Borders from 7 to 9. And then you guys say you have quite a following in Poughkeepsie. Without a doubt. Yeah. You're going to be there Saturday at uh, Media Play, South Hills uh, Mall, 5 o'clock to whenever, basically. Yeah, yeah. Hey, if this thing's still doing good in a few weeks, can I show back up in studio? We'd well, really yeah. love to have you back. Because right. we're just getting started. I mean, everyone wants to talk to you on the hey, phone. I know. You Funny keep looking over there. I'm, I'm, like, pointing at the screen here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you. Go. I keep going like this, and he's like, who is he? Where are they? Who is he pointing yeah. his phone calls out the front door? We'll answer those phone calls next time. But, next uh, time. All right. Yeah, but he's gotta, going to the WWE. WF Restaurant. He'll be there in like 15, 20 minutes to sign right. sign the new book. Foley is good. Uh, Mick Foley, this has been a pleasure. Seriously. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks a lot. And come back soon. I will. The Opie and Anthony Show. You will never see a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. 1027. WNEW. Hey, Anthony. Yes. Worldwide Monkey.